Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Jess with So Many Creations. Today's video is going to be a little bit different because it's geared towards beginners. This video is for all of you out there wanting to make your first bag or people that have made a bag or two and still don't fully understand how to make bags, what all the terminology is. We're gonna make a simple, easy bag. This is the Taurus tote bag. So this is one of my older patterns. This is from 2011. It was the first year of my pattern writing. I still sell a ton of this pattern. All of my seasoned bag makers who know how to do all these complex things, who are getting into cork and vinyl and hardware, they still make this bag because it's a quick and easy make. Something you can make for a gift, something you can make for yourself. I carry one of these with my laptop and all of my work supplies. So if you've never made a bag or if you are maybe a bag or two in and you're still a little bit unsure, this is the video for you. If that's not you and you are an intermediate or an advanced bag maker, of course you're welcome to stick around, but just know that other than walking through the tutorial, we're also gonna be talking about basics. We're gonna talk about top stitching. We're gonna talk about what boxing a corner means. We're going to talk about how to properly interface. Fusible interfacing can be kind of overwhelming, especially when you're brand new. I'm gonna give you some options and I'm gonna really take my time and give you all the information I possibly can. I want you, my first time bag maker, to complete a project that you're really proud of. So if you need the pattern, you can head over to the website right here and you can download your pattern. If you've got that, once you have all your materials gathered, we're gonna go ahead and just jump right into it. First things first, I'm gonna go through the supplies that we'll need, which are super basic. Um, by the way, in case I didn't mention, this pattern and all of my other patterns are domestic friendly. So don't feel that you need a special machine to make bags. Maybe in the future you'll wanna do that, but for now you can use any sewing machine that you have on hand. We'll need a quarter of an inch foot, some of our basic supplies like scissors and thread, but really we don't need a lot of fancy things. We're gonna cut all of our pieces using a ruler and rotary cutter. This pattern doesn't have pieces or templates in the pattern, so it's really great for quilters or even garment makers. If this is kind of your first uh, foray into bag making and you do some other sewing and you just thought, I wanna try something new, this is definitely the video for you. So if you like videos like this, don't forget to hit subscribe, click the notification bell and give it a thumbs up. All right, let's get into it. Okay, so let's talk about this bag kind of in general. When we get into bag making, there's so many different things to learn, so many different things to know. And honestly, I've been doing this for, uh, oh geez, almost 20 years now I've been making bags. That sounds crazy. And there's still things that I learned. There's still techniques and terminology and different things that I'm learning every day. So the basics that you're going to learn today, we're going to talk about making handles. The way that I make handles, it's a pretty common way. It is not making a tube. You might look at this and think, is this a long tube of fabric that I have to turn right side out? The answer is no. I'm gonna show you the folding technique that I have been doing since day one. It's the technique that I learned and I think it makes it super easy. It's very adaptable for any size handle. It's great for cotton because it will hide all the raw edges. You can also use it for other materials as well. So this is our handle and what is hard to see for you is the top stitching. Top stitching is usually more decorative. Sometimes it can also be functional, but top stitching is just what I have um, sewn the handles together with. So this is one wider piece of fabric, which you'll see when we get into our um, pieces. And I folded it into four pieces. So this is four layers of cotton and interfacing. Once it's folded, I have to stitch it. So right here is what I call the open side. This is the side where the edges have been folded in. This is the folded side. Now, a lot of bag makers, at least when I first started, I don't think so as much anymore, but back when I first started, they would just sew this side because it's the only open side. It's the only side that technically needed to be stitched. Myself, I don't like that look. I like to have it even on both sides. So if I do something on the right, I'm gonna do it on the left. For me, I love double top stitching. This is a personal preference. You can choose to do whichever you would like. All that I would recommend is whatever you do for this handle, do for the second handle. If you have a bag that has multiple handles, maybe it has an adjustable handle, it has a few short handles, do the same thing to look consistent. It will make your bags look more handmade rather than homemade, and it'll give it a professional look. 
So I do an eighth inch because that keeps my handle secure and tight, keeps this opening closed. And I do a quarter of an inch because I think it looks great. This is a one inch wide handle. For anything one inch and up, that's what I like to do. Now, if I'm working on a bag with a really skinny handle, I just usually do the eighth inch. When we get into top stitching our handles, I'll show you my favorite foot and how I like to stitch it. The next part of the bag is the top. So it's either the outside or the exterior, very simple. And I call this the top because it's the top. So there's really no technical name for this right here. And you guessed it, this is the bottom. So we have our exterior or our outside top and bottom. We have our handles and then we have our lining. And there's the lining right there. There's no pockets, no zippers. This is, or it should be, an anxiety-free simple bag. So when we're looking at the depth right here, you see that the bag can actually stand up on its own. The bag has some depth right here. Those are made from corners, which are essentially just squares. And once we cut the squares, we do a technique called boxing the corners. And what boxing means is it takes it from a flat square to a three-dimensional shape. So our bag is gonna be totally flat until we box those corners. And that's a very simple term that you'll see in a lot of bags. There's also different ways that you can make depth. There's a gusset, which is going to be something that is totally separate. So this would be a separate piece right here to add depth. We're not gonna do that on today's bag. We're just gonna box our corners. And when it comes to the lining, what we're gonna do with this lining in order to finish it up is we're going to do what is called a turn style or a birthed bag. And what that means is that the outside and the lining will be made separately and put together and we will turn it through an opening left in the bottom of the lining. That is why it's called birthed or turned. Now a drop-in lining, that is a totally different uh, style bag. That's not something we're gonna do today. But if you hear that term, it's just a matter of how you're finishing the bag. There's also bags that have binding inside. You will not find binding on any of my patterns. And I, I don't foresee that in the future either because it's not my favorite technique. It gives a lot of structure, but it's not the easiest thing to do and get neat. Not, it's not a hard technique. It's just something that can be a little frustrating if you aren't familiar with it or if you haven't had enough practice to make it look good. Now, a lot of bag makers, they can make it look amazing. I am not one of them. So my bags are all turn style. They could also be drop in linings as you, you know, grow you know, your terminology and your knowledge with bag making, you might decide that you like a birthed bag versus a drop in lining or vice versa. So again, today we're going to do a folded handle and top stitch it. We have our top and bottom pieces that will be sewn together. We will cut and box corners and we will do a turn style lining. So now that we've discussed the parts of the bag, let's talk about interfacing. I have here my two most used and favorite interfacings. We're gonna talk a little bit about them, how to use them and what the difference is. Now I'm gonna tell you right now, <laughs> you're going to get into bag making. I know you're gonna love it. And as you get into bag making, you are going to hear so many people debate on whether you should use fusible interfacing, whether these interfacings are good. There is, there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of, choices to make. And as you get into bag making, you of course can make any choice that you like. You can mix it up. You don't ever have to use these again if you don't care for them. But I think the biggest issue that people have with fusible interfacings, especially these, but especially, most especially this one, is that they're not adhering it properly and they're not putting it onto their fabric in a way that will make it adhere properly, and that's why they get frustrated. So that's just my two cents, so we're gonna talk about that. Let's talk about what these are that I have in front of me. So these are both Pellon products. The reason I use Pellon products myself, I can find them very easily through my distributors so I can carry them on my website. They are very easy to find at box stores. Not all of you have a quilt shop or have a lot of options where you live, most of you have a Joann's, a Hobby Lobby, a Walmart, somewhere within driving distance that you can get these, and these are pretty readily um, available. Again, I sell them on my website, but you can also find them online on many different websites. This one right here is number 809, Decor Bond. I have been using Decor Bond for close to 20 years. I don't have issues with it, but I understand why people do. We'll talk about that. 
This one right here is 525. This is Decoville Light. This one for me is newer. I probably been using this, I would say about five or six years, give or take. And I love this one. There's good and bad to both. So this one right here, you can see the bolt is fairly long and it's folded in half. This is the same width as fabric. So for me, if I'm getting a quarter yard of fabric and I get a quarter yard of this, I have enough to interface my whole piece of fabric. So it works out nicely. I generally don't have to piece it. And when I say piece it, we're gonna have a lot of side notes in this video. I don't sew my pieces together and I also don't butt them up next to each other. I very slightly overlap them so I don't get a permanent crease. That's especially important in handles. Decoville Light, I find it adheres so beautifully. It just is, it's one of the easiest interfacings to adhere, but as you can see, it's kind of short. It's 17 inches. I have no idea why that is. I don't know why that was a choice that was made, but if I have a quarter yard of fabric, a quarter yard of Decoville Light is not gonna be enough. It's only 17 inches wide. So I'm going to need to double plus a little extra. So the only downfall to that is that I will have to piece certain things. Again, that's not a big deal, but it just makes the um, process of getting my pieces ready a little bit more time consuming. There is Decoville Light out in the world that is 36 inches wide, I believe. I know it's not quite 44, but there is wider. It's hard to find. This is more the standard. So as much as I love this, I do tend to use the decor bond more, especially when I'm doing handles. So both of these are fusible. Decor bond sometimes can be a little fussy with its fusing. It's hard for you to see, but there's a shiny side right here and you can feel the bumps. And right here is the smoother side. So the bumpy, shinier side is what's gonna go on the back of your fabric. With Decoville Light, it's a very smooth, shiny surface. Not sure if the light will pick up on that, but the glue or the adhesive is very evenly added onto this and I think it fuses a lot easier. So when it comes time to fusing, or for fusing, um, I probably don't do it correctly, but I'll tell you what works for me. First of all, the instructions, throw them out. I don't care for the instructions. They talk about settings. They talk about how to move your iron. Seconds, they talk about um, using a, a cloth. I don't do any of that. I've never done any of that. So what I do, first choice, if I have the choice, and if you have the choice, I use a t-shirt press. I understand that is not in everyone's budget or space limits, but I love using my, my press. And the reason is a t-shirt press is hot and evenly distributed heat and evenly distributed pressure. That is what these interfacings want more than anything. They want an even amount of heat distributed. So if you have a t-shirt press, mine is um, just an easy, you know, uh, not a clamp style, maybe it's a clamp style. I'm sorry, I can't remember. It just has a lever and you pull it down. So it's a very easy one to use. I just put my uh, press on about 300 to 315 degrees and I interface for anywhere from 20 to 30 seconds at a time. It depends again on the fabric. Like this is a lightweight cotton where this is a little bit heavier cotton. So I might take a few extra seconds for this. But all I'm doing is just holding that down and letting it kind of sit and evenly distribute the heat with a lot of pressure. And what that does is it makes my interfacing look beautiful and it adheres really nicely. This one takes a little bit less because it is a little on the heavier side and the fusible part adheres faster. So if you're at home and you don't have a t-shirt press and you have no intentions of getting one, here's what I do. I use my iron. This is the iron that I use every day. It's off, just so you know, don't panic. This is a Sunbeam, um, let's see here, is there any information? Probably not. This is just a Sunbeam iron, it's nothing fancy. I think it cost me under $40. My steam can be on, but sometimes I will turn it off and just use the button, depends on my mood. And I have my heat setting, which is right here, turned all the way up to linen. I crank it as high as it will go. I don't know the temperature because irons don't give you a temperature, but it's on linen. So I go as hot as possible, especially if I'm doing handles. I turn the steam off just because I don't want to burn my fingers as I'm kind of working my way along. But I usually have water in here. 
It is tap water. It's nothing fancy. And I use the steam when I'm interfacing. So what I'm doing, I have my piece of fabric laid on top of my interfacing. So the wrong side of the fabric is going to the bumpy, fusible side of the interfacing. I do not inter I do not iron on the interfacing unless I absolutely have to because this will shrink. This is a polyester based. It is not a woven interfacing. So once you put your iron on here, you will get some shrinkage. You will get less from the fabric side. So once I have my fabric down, I just kind of work my way out. I am not putting a lot of pressure. I am not pushing really hard. I'm just kind of lightly gliding it back and forth. I keep it moving gently. And if I have a really large piece, like for the top here, I'll work my way from the outside, kind of work out, hold it for a few seconds on the corners, kind of work my way around. And I just keep going as much as I can until it's all done. And if I have a spot that's not quite sticking, I take my pressing clappers. These have my, names engra my name engraved on them. Don't be distracted by that. But this is really just a piece of wood and what this does is it allows my interfacing to cool at a slower pace and it allows some pressure on there. So if I'm ironing and I have that one stubborn spot that just doesn't want to stick, I just put my pressing clapper on it. Sometimes I'll do a little, a little bit of that, just leave it and I'll walk away. I also use these when I'm ironing my handles because then it allows, again, my interfacing to cool if you fold your handle, and again, we're gonna talk about that, so don't worry. If you just fold your handle and keep on ironing, a lot of times it wants to open because the interfacing hasn't cooled yet. So I use my pressing clappers. So if I am, do not have my t-shirt press, if I'm at home, this is my combination. If I am here and I have my t-shirt press, that's what I like to use. I've done some videos on these that have a little bit more explanation. I will try to link them above for you. If not, you can find them in the interfacing playlist on my channel. So now that we've talked about interfacing, and there's so many choices, I really cannot, it would take me an entire day or more to get into every choice of interfacing. These are the two that I like. Try them. Try them out. See what you think. Um, see if you like them. And if you don't, it's okay. It's totally fine to skip. The reason uh, that I like to use fusible interfacing one, I'm kind of lazy. I don't really want to have to worry about basting or doing something with interfacing. I don't want to add an extra step. These are fusible. All I need is a heat source. The other reason that I like these is because once they're on, they're done. I don't quilt my bags. That's not a technique that I use. I don't want to take my pieces to the machine and base them. And I don't want to have to do anything extra. So I just find the convenience of fusible is for me. If you don't like the fusible, if you find that you really don't like it or you find an interfacing you want to use that's not fusible, you could spray baste it. That would be totally fine. And I used to do that many, many years ago before I knew anything. But it's up to you. You're going to find different interfacings work for different bags or for your style. And that's something that you will learn as you go on. So now that we've talked about our interfacing and our terminology, let's go through the pieces for this bag. There's eight pieces, they're all interfaced, and I have not done any prep work except cutting them. So let's go ahead and grab those and go through our different pieces. I have all of my pieces already prepped for today's pattern. I've gone ahead and cut them as per the directions. On page one, it's going to give you all of your sizes. And on page two for step one, is going to talk about fusing, what we just discussed. So I've already gone ahead and interfaced each of these pieces. I use decor bond. So for my A pieces, those are gonna be my outside top. And when you're doing your cutting, remember that your width is gonna go across your bag and your height is going from top to bottom. So if you would like to use a directional fabric, and directional just means that it has a top and a bottom, which mine really doesn't. I could turn this in either direction. You're gonna make sure that you cut it correctly, again, width versus height. And when we get into uh, putting the pieces together, when we're ready to put our handles on and sew them together, you'll just wanna pay attention if you have something directional. I don't, so it's totally fine. So I have two of these, both with interfacing on the back. I have my two B pieces, B is for the bottom. Those are going to be the same width, but a little bit shorter in height than our top. 
I am using a cotton denim. It's actually a very lightweight denim. It's not, when you hear denim, like a pair of jeans, it's just a cotton um, lighter weight denim. So a little heavier than Quilter's cotton, which I'm using for the rest of the bag. I've also gone ahead and interfaced these pieces. Side note, if you would like to use something different for the bottom, such as cork, you can skip the interfacing. Many times in the past, I have interfaced it just to have a really sturdy base to my bag, but I've come to realize that it doesn't make that much of a difference, so sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. If you want to interface cork, here's one little, one little uh, change from what we've already discussed. The interfacing is fusible and the cork is thick. You can put an iron on cork, but you won't get enough heat through. So what I would suggest is that you iron on the backside. I know I just told you not to do that because it will shrink, but the cork itself won't shrink, so you're not going to affect anything. So if you choose to do something on the bottom that is not cotton and you want to interface it, you'll have to interface on the backside. So there's my two bottom pieces. Everything in this pattern is in twos. I have my two C's, which are my handles. These, if they were regular quilters cotton, would have the selvages still on them. Because this was actually a 60 inch wide fabric, I trimmed it down to the 42 inches that is noted in the pattern. I did not leave it, um, I didn't leave it extra long because I find that this tote bag is fine with 42 to 44 inches of length. You definitely did not want to do 60. That would have made this bag very strange. So I trim this down, but normally you'd see my selvage and I just interface right to the end of the selvage. So I have both of these cut out and ready to go. I haven't done any of my pressing because we're going to talk about that and work through it together. And last but not least, I have my two D pieces. These are going to be for my lining. Now, when it comes to the lining, and we'll discuss this when we get to boxing the corners, your width and your height are very, very similar. There is about a two inch difference between the width and the height. It is slightly wider. So if you have a directional fabric, again, pay attention. Your width is gonna be a little wider than your height. And when it comes time to cut and box our corners, we wanna make sure we don't accidentally turn this, which is easy to do. And I'll show you a little trick to make sure that you get it correct. This is it. I have just my eight pieces. Every one of them has interfacing. It's all set to go. So now that we have all of our pieces prepped and ready to go, before we get into step two, which is going to be prepping our handles, let's talk about the other supplies that I have gathered for today, and I'll show you my favorite feet to use on my domestic. I grabbed all the rest of the supplies and tools I'm going to need for today, so let's go through those. If you're already into sewing, if you are a quilter or a garment maker, you might have a lot of these tools. For me, I already had them from quilting. So for all of my cutting, I use my mat, my rotary cutter, and my ruler. I do have several longer rulers. That makes it a lot easier. I just grabbed this small one today for boxing the corners. Speaking of boxing the corners, this is a template that I designed that I sell on my website. It is not necessary to make this bag. You do not have to purchase this. However, if you get into bag making, this is a corner ruler. And what I love about this is I don't have to worry about my ruler. I can just use the measurements here and I can cut corners from a half inch up to four inches. So this is gonna be really handy for today's bag and for many other bags that have box corners. Pretty much any of the bags that have box corners with I think one exception. So I'm gonna go ahead and use this, but I'll also show you how to use your ruler when we get to that part. We talked about pressing clappers. I think if you're going to get into bag making, those are going to be very handy. They're also really great for other types of um, sewing. I have a marking tool. I'm using a friction pen. This is the heat erasable pen. The markings that we're going to do today are going to be on uh, the corners and also on the front of the bag. I'm gonna show you a couple of different techniques for adding your handles. I may grab my chalk pencil. It all depends. I didn't look too closely at my fabric, but this one might not show. So I always have various marking tools, dark ones and light ones. That way I have all my bases covered. I also have my seam ripper because I can't sew without that. It's kind of a necessity. So this is a seam ripper and stiletto combo. The stiletto comes in handy for a lot of um, bag making. I don't think I'll need it for today, but I may need my seam ripper, so I'll keep that nearby. Scissors, I always have a nice sturdy pair of scissors. These are Kai scissors. 
They're very sturdy, but still lightweight, so they're easy on your hands. When you get into making bags with hardware, sometimes you have to cut holes, which I know is terrifying. We don't have to do that today. But when you need to cut out for a piece of hardware, you want something sturdy and you want something that's not really small. Tiny little scissors, which are great for clipping threads, can be a little bit too small when you're cutting hardware. But I'm gonna use these today for cutting out my box corners and also for doing any trimming. I also have clips and pins. Now I will admit that in the beginning, I used pins exclusively because clips were not a thing. So you can definitely use pins. These are some of my favorite. These are called magic pins. They're actually a heat resistant um, end. I assume it's some kind, of, some kind of heat resistant material. I don't know exactly what it is. But this right here, I find is easy to pick up. I have long nails and I can still pick it right up off the table. They're nice sturdy pins. These are the blue ones. Um, I also have some glass head pins. Anytime I use pins, I wanna make sure that they are heat resistant because you never know if you're gonna hit them with the iron. For today, I probably won't use too many pins. I'm going to be relying on my clips. And these right here, I have some glittery clips right here because they're pretty. They work the same as any of your other clips. And these are actually made for binding. These were made originally for quilters, but bag makers kind of gobbled them up and now we use them. And I don't sew a bag without these. If I have to sew and my clips are not nearby, I can't sew. I feel like it just doesn't work. So I have all of those. Let's now talk about setting up our sewing machine. For today, I'm going to use my heavy duty machine. It's just a mechanical straight stitch machine. It's already set up, that's why I'm using that one today. But the bag we're making is 100% um, domestic friendly. So if you have any kind of sewing machine, really anything, whether it's a 1970s machine you've had forever or a brand new top of the line that does embroidery, you can make this bag on any of them. What I would recommend is making sure you have the right tools for your machine to make bag making successful. So the first thing is your needle. I always use a 9014 Microtex needle, or if I don't have any of these, I'll use a top stitch needle. This is my preferred bag making needle. It's um, extra sharp. That's what the Microtex part is. So because it's extra sharp, it goes through all of those thicker layers and heavier seams really nicely. The 9014 size is my preferred size because I do work with cork a lot and some heavier materials. Today, you could probably get away with a size 80, but if you're getting into it, grab some of these. I don't think you'll regret it. As far as thread is concerned, there are so many choices. You can use cotton, which is what I have here. You can use polyester. You can use pretty much any kind of thread. I would just recommend that you go a little heavier than you would if you were making a quilt, let's say. So when I quilt, I use a size 50. That is the orange cone in Aurifil. This one, the green one, is a size 40. It's a 40 weight, I should say. This is just a little bit thicker. It's just a slightly heavier thread, which is going to give my bag durability, but it's also gonna look really nice on my handles. I also use some polyester threads. We've discussed this a lot on the channel as well as on my Friday Lives. If you have questions about thread, you can definitely get answers pretty much from anybody that makes bags, but I'm warning you, the answers will be all across the board. So if you're already doing some kind of sewing, you can probably just use the thread that you have. That's what I started with. I had a bunch of 50 weight, that's what I used. Now that I've gotten into bag making and it's a business instead of a hobby, I really bumped it up and I went to at least a 40 weight in my cotton, but I also use a lot of polyester. Now for feet, let's talk about the most important thing. With the right foot, you can make an incredible bag. And this is what's going to help you get nice straight top stitching, even seam allowances. It's just going to make your experience so much better. I love a foot that has a guide on it. I know not everybody does. Uh, some people don't like to use this kind of a foot that has this little guide. I find that it makes me better. So this right here, this is from my Janome. It's an O foot, which is a quarter of an inch. So I have a little bit of room to move my needle if I wanna do a scant quarter inch, a wider quarter inch, whatever I would like. And it has this guide right here. So once I line my fabric up right along that guide, I can get a great quarter of an inch seam. And this works nicely for top stitching my handles and also for my seam allowance, which is going to be a quarter of an inch today. 
Now, as far as my eighth inch top stitching, which is usually the first part I do on my, on my handles, my eighth inch can be a little tricky because it's kind of hard to find a spot on your machine and keep everything straight, especially when you have that thicker folded handle piece. So what I like to use is one of these two feet. This one right here, my S foot, this is a stitch in the ditch foot. And this is my G foot, which is a blind hem foot. They are very similar from the top. The main difference is that the guide right here, it sticks out a lot further on the stitch in the ditch. It's not quite as far on the blind hem foot. But what I do with this foot is I move my needle position all the way to the left, as far left as I can get it. And when I put my handle right here on this side, on the left hand side of that guide, my needle just catches and it's about an eighth could be a little bit less give or take but it gives me beautiful top stitching this is something i have done for years it's a little something i discovered one day when i was playing with my feet and i said oh this might work and i absolutely love it because what happens is it keeps everything straight because it's running right along that edge and since my needle is right over here on the left hand side it gives me great top stitching so those would be the feet that I would use if I had my domestic today. It's actually being cleaned, <laughs> so I don't have it. But I'm just gonna use my straight stitch machine. That machine I already have a quarter inch and an eighth inch foot for, so I'm gonna do the same thing. Step two of your pattern is going to be prepping the handles. So I have one already folded here. I have not done any stitching. I'm gonna show you how to fold your handle. So as I mentioned earlier, I don't do the um, tube method of making a handle where basically I would be folding this right sides together, sewing it and turning it. That's a lot of tube to turn. And I just find that they never come out straight. I think some of my early bags, I had done it that way because it's how I learned. And I quickly realized that I did not care for that technique. So what we're gonna do here, since we have cotton and interfacing, I have my interfacing uh, side faced up. This handle is going to be four inches when it's cut, so it's one inches finished. This technique where we fold in fours, if you want to adapt your handle for this bag or any other, all you're going to do is multiply your finished size by four. So if I wanted a handle that was two inches finished, I would cut it eight inches wide. So I have a four inch wide strip by my width of fabric. What I'm gonna do at the ironing board is first, fold this in half, wrong sides together or interfacing sides together, and I'm gonna iron a crease in the middle. And what's gonna happen, even though I iron it, it's still gonna open up. That's why my pressing clapper is always nearby. So I'm going to iron, I'm going to make a crease in the middle, then I'm going to take this side, fold it in towards the crease, again, press that, fold my other side in and press, and at this point, it's gonna kinda look like that because it wants to open up again. So once I have these folded and pressed, I'm gonna do my final press where I fold it completely in half. And as I go, I iron, put my clapper down. Iron some more, move my clapper. And if I do that, when I'm done, my handle is pretty flat. It stays nice and tight and closed. And that's gonna make things a lot easier at the machine. So now that I have this ready, I'm gonna head back over and finish this one so they both look the same. The only raw edges I'm seeing are down here on these ends and those go into seams, so we don't care about that. I'm gonna go over to my machine and do my top stitching. You can do whatever kind of top stitching you would like. I am gonna do a double top stitch and normally I would put black thread on. Today I'm gonna to use a purple thread so it shows up really well so I can show you the finished look. I would highly suggest, <laughs> don't ask me why I know this, maybe years of experience of making poor choices, if you use a contrasting thread, you may not like it when it's done if your stitching isn't straight. So what I've said many times, contrast is great if your stitching is straight. And if your stitching is not good or you're not confident with it, if you don't have the proper foot, I would say blend. Because if I put black thread on here, you will never know if my stitching is a little bit crooked. If it doesn't look great, it'll be totally fine. The other thing about top stitching is that I like to increase my stitch length. So on my standard domestic machine, my stitch length is about a 2.5. That's for my seams. 
For my top stitching, I will usually go up to three, even 3.5. When you do a longer stitch length, it looks a lot nicer. It also goes through your thicker layers a little bit better. And I just think it gives it such a professional look. On my heavy duty machine, I might even go up to a four. They do vary a little bit and sometimes the heavy duty likes to be even longer. So that's what I'm gonna do for these. I'm gonna finish prepping this and I'm gonna go ahead and do my stitching. Now, again, if you don't wanna do double top stitching, that's fine. But if you're only going to do one row on either side, I would suggest that it was eighth inch because it's going to keep this edge nice and closed. I wouldn't do quarter because I don't think you'll be happy in the end because this will start to separate. So either just an eighth on the right and the left or an eighth and a quarter like I'm gonna do. I'll see you back here when I have my handles all prepped. Step two is complete. I've gone ahead and top stitched both of my handles. I did use a contrasting thread, which typically I wouldn't do, but I wanted to make sure that you could see the top stitching. So I'll hold that nice and close for you. So I have my eighth inch from each side and my quarter of an inch. That's how I like to do my stitching. This is my open side right here and there is my closed side, but now that it's all stitched, it's hard to even tell. Both of them are done the same exact way. So step three is going to be adding our finished handles to the top sections of our bag. Now there's a few different ways that you can do this. These are discussed in the pattern. One of the things that I did not mention in the supplies earlier was double stick tape because it is not a necessity for this bag. You have several other options. It is something that I find I use in bag making every single time I make a bag, but this might not be something you have on hand if this is your first bag. So I'm going to show you how I use this, but if you don't have this tool, totally fine. I'm gonna give you a few different options and ways that you can get your handles ready. So basically what you're going to be doing, I'll show you how it's supposed to look and then we'll talk about how to get it there. We're going to have one handle per top piece. We do one handle on what would be the front and one on the back. Some people tend to confuse that and they wanna do their handles connecting the two pieces. You definitely don't wanna do that. It would make your bag sit incorrectly. So one handle per top piece. First thing you're going to do is find your center and then you're going to, <clears throat> excuse me, you're going to be placing your handles six inches apart and that's an inside dimension. So whenever you see that in one of my patterns where I say that your handles are six inches apart, four inches apart, whatever the, the measurement is, it's measuring on the inside. So it does not matter how wide your handles are. So if you chose to do them wider for today, let's say, your measurement is still gonna be the same. So what you can do is just very simply find your center, lay your ruler down, and lay your handle right up against your ruler to keep it straight. We wanna keep the edges as well as the center part straight. In doing that, you can grab some pins, and I'm gonna show you my favorite little pinning technique. You can also use clips. You can mark with a chalk pencil or a pen, or you can use double stick tape. So let's go ahead. I have my other piece already worked up for me, so I'll show you how that's going to go and some of your different options. One other quick thing I just wanna mention, and we'll talk about this when we get to pinning this down. You wanna make sure that your handle is not twisted. And that's gonna be really important because if you twist your handle, sometimes you don't notice it until it's all done. So when I look at my handle here, I can see that it's nice and straight. That's what I'm gonna concentrate on when I add my handle onto this piece. So I'm gonna move these out of the way. So what I did here is I made a mark at the top and the bottom. So I just take my piece, I fold it in half like this, and I make a tiny little snip, just big enough for me to see because I want it to be hidden in the seam allowance later. So now what I'm gonna do for option number one is just lay my ruler down. If you have a six inch ruler, that's perfect. Most of my rulers, actually I think all of them are now six and a half inches, so they're a little bit bigger than I need. But if you have a six inch ruler, that is perfect. You can lay it right on your fabric and add your handle. So if you're doing the ruler technique, what you're going to do here, and don't mind my marks, I'm gonna talk about those in a minute. You're just gonna lay your handle so the raw edge is at the bottom. Again, if you have directional fabric, this is your top. I'm laying my handle at the bottom and I'm gonna add a pin. That's gonna be option number one. So what I find is the best way to not bend my pins. I kind of put it in at an angle and then I pick up my piece and I fold it like that and I can push my pin through. If you have really fine pins, this is where you might bend them even with this technique. 
So invest in some better pins if you don't have them right now. If you're using really, really fine pins because of the sewing that you're doing, maybe go a little bit larger, just a little chunkier pin for your bag making. So what I would do is just continue pinning all the way up. And on this side, again, I'm gonna make sure my handle is not twisted. And the best way for me to tell, there's two things I check. Right here is my open side. It does not matter, but mine is right here. So my open side should be also on the outside. If it's facing out, it should face out. And what I do is I just kind of straighten my handle like this, and I can see that it's not twisted. This is what a twist looks like. We don't want that. We don't want our handle to do that. We want it to look just like so. So if I don't want to pin, or if I have a material that I can't pin, here's a second option. I went ahead with my friction pen. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see that, but I used something that was heat erasable or removable in some way. I made my mark here and I would make my other mark over here. And what I'll do is I'll just take some clips, place my handle again right here, add a few clips. I'm not gonna be able to clip in the middle, but if I have my mark there, I can keep an eye on it when I'm sewing. And I can just add my clips like that and then I can do the same on the other side. Now what I've done on this one is I did add some double stick tape. So I made my two marks six inches apart in the center. I added some double stick tape on this mark. I'm gonna peel my paper off. That is always easier said than done. There we go. And I'm gonna make sure my handle is not twisted. Nice and straight line it up on the bottom and stick it right down. And then I can also double check with my ruler and I can even use a few clips. Now for the tape, you might've noticed that I didn't go all the way to the top. And there's a reason for that. We might be clipping and checking our measurements up here, but we're not sewing all the way up here. When our handle is in place, whichever method you wanna use, pins, clips, tape, marks, whichever is easier for you, you're only going to stitch to about two inches from the top. And the reason for that, let me grab the finish bag. We need to have enough room for our seam allowance at the top so our handle can't go all the way to the top. If it goes all the way up here, you'll end up sewing through it and that's gonna defeat the handle. So we need to give it some room. So I leave about two inches from the top. So what I would do right here is I do mark mine with something, again, that's removable. I just find that it's easier to have a mark than to try to eyeball it at the machine, especially with this contrasting thread. I don't want my marks to be off. So I will measure down two inches and make a mark. When it's time to sew, I'm gonna follow my eighth inch top stitching as best as I can. And sometimes that is perfect and sometimes it's not and it's totally fine. I have been doing this a long time. I'm still not perfect, so it's okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start down here, I'm gonna stitch on the eighth inch all the way up to that two inch mark, reinforce it about two to three times, stitch back and forth, because you really wanna reinforce, it's gonna be a weak spot if you don't, and you'll end up tearing your handle. Then I'm gonna come over here to this eighth inch, come all the way down, and if I want, I can stitch across the bottom an eighth of an inch. It really doesn't matter whether you do or you don't, because you're going to have a bottom piece here, and that seam allowance will cover everything up. I'm gonna do the same thing with the other side, so I will have two top halves with handles. Once I'm done with that, we can get ready to add the bottom. My top pieces are all done, so step three is complete. Let's take a look. I have my top pieces, my A's. Each of those has a handle sewn on, so one handle per top. I started down at the bottom, followed my eighth inch top stitching all the way up, about two inches from the top, and I stitched about three times across to reinforce, and then I came back down. On this one, I stitched on the bottom an eighth of an inch, and on this one I did not because it really does not make a difference. I do backstitch everything. I've just gotten into the habit of doing that with any of my sewing, so it really doesn't make a difference if you start up here and go up or if you stitch across the bottom. It's, it's okay either way. So this is all done. This one is all done. So now that these are complete, we can grab our Bs, our bottoms, and go ahead and finish up the outside of the bag. Step four is going to be sewing the B pieces onto our A tops. 
So I'm gonna just take one of each and set the other ones aside. I'm gonna grab my clips here. You can use clips or pins for this step. And what I'm going to do here is take my two pieces and I'm gonna take my bottom right sides together with the top, just like so. So I'm looking at my interfacing. I'm gonna add some clips right along here. I am only sewing the bottom edge, but if I have clips on the side, that's totally fine. Sometimes it just helps to get everything kind of anchored. So I'm just lining up my raw edges. I would guess that most of you don't have a directional fabric for your bottom, but just in case you do, make sure that the top edge is right here. So the top edge of your print will go to the bottom edge of the top. I have denim, doesn't have a top or a bottom. So I'm gonna do the same thing with the other half. Let me move this over. There is my top half, my handle is facing upwards. I'm going to take my bottom B and put it right sides together, right along the bottom edge. So this is going to cover up the raw edge of the handles that we just sewed in. I can add clips on the side if it makes it easier. Just gonna go ahead and clip. You can also pin. Once you start using clips, I don't think you're gonna wanna go back to pins. <laughs> they're just so much easier and they're so great with bag making and all the thick layers that we get into. So I have this one and the other one all set. At my sewing machine, I'm going to stitch a quarter of an inch just across the bottom. That's it. Make sure that I backstitch when I start and stop. This is going to add the bottom on. It's also gonna anchor the handles down. So we're gonna do a quarter of an inch seam allowance from this side all the way over here, making sure to backstitch. Now that I have both of my halves sewn, I did my quarter of an inch seam, it's time to talk about pressing and top stitching. So what you're going to wanna do before we go any further is give this a good press, and then we're gonna do our top stitching. So let's take a look at just one of these pieces. In a perfect world, and this will all depend on my pressing as well as the materials I've chosen, I like to press one of these seams down and the other one up. And the reason is when it comes time to construct the bag and to sew the main seams, it's going to make it a lot less bulky, so it'll be easier on our sewing machine, and it's also going to sit nicely together. Now the issue with that sometimes is if I have something heavy on the bottom like cork that really wants to push my seam up, and I have my handles right here, which really wanna push my seam down, sometimes I can't control that. So I do the best that I can. I think today I'll be okay to press in opposite directions, and if you can't, that's totally fine. Some days it just doesn't wanna work. So once I have this pressed and ready to go, I'm gonna do my top stitching. Top stitching on this is, it's structural if you go through your seam, but it's mostly um, just decorative. It is just to add a nice finished look to the bag. So if I press my seam up and I stitch down here, it's not going through the seam, so it's not adding anything structurally. When it comes to top stitching, you can choose if you wanna do an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch, and you can choose if you wanna sew on the bottom, the top, or both. Now here are my thoughts on that. I always sew on the bottom. This is my nice clean edge right here, so I always stitch from this seam either an eighth or a quarter. I've even done both. It kind of depends on how I'm feeling that day. I would say for today, I'm probably going to do a quarter of an inch. I think that would look nice, especially because I have a contrasting thread. It'll just kind of stand out a little bit more and show it. When it comes to stitching on the top, I don't like to stitch on the top. The reason is, I it's a personal thing. I don't like how it looks when I go over the handle. And that is a totally a me thing. If you like that look, or if you want to stitch on the top and the bottom, by all means you can. It will not harm your bag, either or. And if you don't want to top stitch at all, I guess you could also skip that, but I think you'll really like it, especially on the bottom. So I'm gonna give this a press. I'm gonna see if I can make my seams do what I want them to do. I'm gonna stitch a quarter of an inch top stitch down here, just on the black part. I'm not gonna stitch on the top because I don't care for how it looks. I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side. And again, bags and symmetry really go hand in hand. Whatever you choose for this half, do for this half. So I wouldn't do a quarter here and an eighth here, or the top and bottom here and just the bottom here. I wanna make sure that they're consistent. So whatever I do on one, I do on the other. 
I completed my top stitching. I took these to the iron and I pressed them. They both really wanted to press down, so I just let it. Again, I try to get my seams to press in the opposite direction. It just wasn't happening for today, and that's okay. It's just going to add a little bit of bulk when I get to the end, but I know that my machine can handle it, and so can yours. So now that I have my top stitching done, and I did my quarter of an inch just on the bottom, we're gonna move on to step five and cut our corners. Now that our top stitching is done, we're going to move on to step five and cut our corners. You're going to be cutting corners from the two outside pieces as well as the two lining pieces. We're gonna start with the outside and then I'll show you a simple little trick to make sure you cut your lining pieces the correct way. So you're going to need a ruler or your box corner template. I will show you how to use both. You'll need scissors and you'll need a pen. Now, back when I started making bags, I was all about cutting corners with my rotary cutter. If you have any of my older patterns, you know that that was my preferred method. But unfortunately, I made too many errors and overcut too many times. I just really don't like using my rotary cutter. You absolutely can. If you are brave, which I am not, I'm just going to use my scissors. I think it's much easier. So what we're gonna do is on the bottom of our two pieces here and our two lining pieces, we're going to mark and measure three and a half inch squares. So I've already done one to show you and then we'll work on the next one together. So this is what our bag is going to look like, just like this. We have just the two bottom corners cut out. We wanna do that with all four of our pieces and here's the easiest way to do that. You're gonna flip this over. I always start with one of my outside pieces because I know exactly where the bottom is. I don't have to worry about measurements or anything. I know that this black uh, denim right here is my bottom. So what I'm going to do, I'll grab this one, is I'm going to show you how to do it with your ruler and also how to do it with the box corner template. So if you're using a ruler, you're just going to grab that and right here on the bottom, I'm going to line up my three and a half right here and right here. I'm just making a square. And I'm just gonna take my pen and just mark like so. If you have a different style ruler, that is fine. If it's easier for you to measure three and a half and draw one line, measure three and a half and draw the second line, that's fine. I'm very comfortable just placing this here and marking my square. For the other one, I'll show you how to use my template. What we're gonna do is line this up on the line above three and a half. So this is a four inch box corner template. So I'm just gonna mark the line right here that's three and a half. I have it lined up on the edge as well as the bottom. And again, I'm just gonna mark like so. So now I'm just gonna take my scissors and cut. As you can see, I'm cutting right on the line. So if I used a pen that wasn't removable, it's totally fine because I'm cutting on it and it's on the back. And when it comes to cutting corners, you can mark on the front or the back. It doesn't make a difference because you're cutting it away. And there's also going to be a seam allowance in here. So if for some reason it was marked wrong or I missed a little bit of the pen, even if it's a permanent pen, it's not gonna make any difference because it's going to be in the seam allowance. So now that I have the outsides done, here's how I address the lining. I'm going to grab one of my lining pieces. And as you can see, if I turn this the wrong way, it's really close. But I tell you this right now, it makes such a huge difference. Your bag will be so dramatically different in size if you turn it the wrong way. So what I do is I just make sure that I am lined up. And if it's the same width, then I have the right place to mark my corners. Let me take a look. Is this directional? It's not. So I'm just gonna mark on the front and I'm just lining that up so I know that these are the two corners I wanna cut. I'm gonna use my template, three and a half. And the other side. All right. I'm gonna do the other lining piece and get it cut. I'll be right back. And I'm all done. I've got all four of my pieces cut. So that's eight total corners, two on each piece. There's my linings. There is my outside. And now we're gonna move on to step six and we're going to start assembling the bag. Now, please note again, if you have the original pattern, 
I did change the assembly instructions. The only reason is it still gets you to the same end result. It's really nothing drastic. In the very beginning when I was making bags, I used to sew an outside and the lining together and it became a very big piece. And then I would put those together. I just found that it kind of got in the way more so than I wanted. Plus as a designer, I have changed my techniques a little bit. So this is going to be just like my other patterns, but it is going to be a little bit different from how the original pattern has it. Um, if you, again, need a new copy or if you would like a new copy, all you have to do is email me your proof of purchase, just something to show that you bought the pattern. Um, a picture would be great. Don't do it through the contact form on the website because you can't attach a picture. Just send it right to the email address that's listed on the website. There's actually two of them and I can email you an updated copy. So now that we got that out of the way, let's start putting this bag together. It's actually pretty simple. And as you can see, it was a fast make. This does not usually take more than a few hours. It's a great weeknight, weekend, uh, last minute gift kind of a thing. So I think as a beginner, I think this is a great bag because you're gonna wanna make a lot of them and you're gonna keep building up your skills and wanting to make more bags. So I'm gonna take my lining pieces, I'm gonna set those aside. And we're gonna start with our outside. And what you're gonna do with your two outside pieces is place them right sides together. You should have your top right sides together, your bottom right sides together, your corners should be together. And what we're gonna do before we do any stitching is just clip. So we're gonna clip or pin all the way around. And I like to start at this seam because I want it to meet up as best as I possibly can. And this little part right here did not get caught in my top stitching. So I'm actually gonna push that up to kind of nest that seam. If you think that's wrong, that's okay. I don't always wanna be right. I like to do it that way sometimes when I can. And so that's where I'm at. So I'm gonna go right over here to this seam, do the same thing if I can. See this one I can't, but that's okay. So. Maybe I can. <laughs> so I'm just gonna line up those side seams. Once I have those lined up, line up my top. Now, if at any point this is not lining up for you, you can absolutely go to your cutting mat and do a little bit of trimming. The only thing you have to remember is that the two outsides and the two linings have to be the same size. So if for some reason something was cut wrong, something shifted, it happens. If you have to trim your outside, let's say a half inch, let's say I have to trim a half inch from the width, just trim that half inch from the lining. Bags just need to fit within each other. So here's how the outside looks. I have my sides as well as my bottom clipped together. I'll throw another one in here just for fun. My handles are sticking out of the top. I'm not stitching the top right now, so the handles can just kind of sit up there. At the sewing machine, I'm going to stitch a quarter of an inch down both of the sides, as well as across the bottom. So I'm just stitching one, two, three seams. I am ignoring the corners for right now, and I am ignoring the top. All right, so those two pieces are already sewn. I did my sides as well as my bottom. So the last thing I need to do to finish up the outside is to box my corners. So we talked about what that term meant. Now I'm gonna show you how to do that. So my bag is totally flat right now. I've gone ahead and cut the squares from both of my sides. So all I'm going to be doing is pulling this side seam and this bottom seam together and pulling the center kind of outwards. So I'm straightening it out and adding dimension. So what I'm gonna do is just kind of put my hand here and the other one here, and I'm pulling that apart. So just like this, I get my two seams lined up. And again, I push one in one direction, one in another, put a clip there. And what this naturally wants to do is kind of point, but we don't want it to do that. So we wanna give it a little tug, straighten it out as best as you can. Now here's another thing to note, because I don't want you to think that you've made a mistake or that it's not fixable. If for some reason your corner is not cut perfectly, and yes, I know this is a little bit, yours could even be off by more, if this is not totally lined up, it's okay. A little tiny bit won't make a difference. You can go in and trim it, but all you really wanna do is just keep this nice and straight. And if this is straight, even if that's off by a hair, it's okay. So let's see how I did on this one. So again, I'm bringing this seam and this seam together, 
taking my centers and pulling them out straight. So just like this, and you're gonna give your bag a little tug, okay? Push my seams in opposite directions, add a clip right in the middle. There's my middle clip, okay? Pull these edges nice and straight, just like so. And it looks like I am off a little bit right here again. My cutting was just not perfect, and that's okay. That little bit can be hidden. So now that I have that done, there's my bag. It actually has some dimension now. I'm gonna go back to the machine and stitch a quarter of an inch right across these bottom edges. Corners are all sewn, so there's how it looks right. For the outside, you're going to turn it right side out. So we're gonna take this and just turn it, and then you get to admire your work. And it actually looks like a bag. So how exciting is that? So what we're gonna do is poke our corners out, check our seams. Yeah, it's not perfect. I can live with it. Let's see how this side looks. Yeah, it's not perfect either, but that's okay. I see a thread hanging out. So we're gonna clip that. All right. Make sure that every seam is looking good. Nothing is in the wrong spot. There's no holes. All right, it looks pretty good so far. So there is the outside of my bag. So I'm gonna go ahead and set this aside. I'm going to repeat this process now with my lining for step seven. We're gonna go ahead and sew the lining together just like we did on the outside with two small exceptions. So I've taken both of my lining pieces. I placed them right sides together, added some clips, at the machine, again, I'm going to sew both of my sides a quarter of an inch. On the bottom, however, I'm going to leave a big opening. Because this is a turnstile or birth bag, we need somewhere to turn it. So I'm going to sew probably from this clip to this clip. So I'm gonna have an opening that's pretty big. That's about seven, eight inches. The reason is, if you leave a tiny little opening, you have to turn the whole bag through it. I want enough to put my entire hand and arm inside and pull the bag through. The bigger the opening, the better. If you don't believe me, all you'll have to do is make one small opening and I think you will see the light. It is worth it. It's well worth it just to have a larger opening. It's just much easier that way. So I'm going to sew again my sides and I'm going to sew a couple inches on either side, leaving a large opening here. Then we'll box the corners again. Lining is sewn, very large opening in the bottom. Let's go ahead and box these corners. One more time, we're bringing our seams together, stitching. Once again, we're gonna be bringing these two seams together and pulling the center so it's nice and flat. We're just gonna do that, give it a little tug, put our seams together. I like to nest them, one going to the right, one to the left. Straighten this out as best as I can. On a smaller bag, I usually don't even use this many clips, I just use one in the center, but since these corners are so large, we'll go ahead and add a few. So here's my last two seams, my center, open that up. Now my lining, will have some body and be able to stand up on its own, just like the outside. So I'm gonna go ahead and stitch these a quarter of an inch. And I said that there were gonna be two small differences from the outside. The first was that we left a hole in the bottom. The second is that when this is done, we are not gonna turn it right side out. Well, we've made it to the final step. And now we're going to put our two pieces together and finish up the bag. We only have a little bit of stitching left to do. So for this final part, this might seem a little bit strange, especially if you've never made a bag. Our logic says that the lining needs to go in the outside. However, with this technique that we're using, it's actually the opposite. So what we're gonna do is fold our handles down, and stand the outside up, stand up my lining, and I'm going to put the outside in the lining. I want these to be right sides together. It seems counterintuitive and a little bit backwards, but I assure you this is correct. So we're just going to put that in there, just kind of push it down. I want my handle inside. It should be between the lining and the outside. 
first thing I always do, line up the seams. Always line up whatever is important and then the rest will fit. So I have my outside and my lining. I'm gonna work on one of these seams, line them up, add a clip, turn this around, same thing. Lining and outside, right sides together. Now I'm gonna work all the way around and add lots of clips. Make sure that my handle is tucked all the way down. I don't want to catch the handle. I don't want it up here where I'm going to sew. So I'm pushing it down out of the way. Just going to keep on clipping. If the technique for finishing was different, we would obviously be doing some different things if this had binding or was a drop in lining but we are sticking with what I think is the simplest and easiest way to finish a bag, which is a turn style. And it is called birthed, or you'll be birthing your bag because we are going to pull it through that hole in the lining when we're done. Now, if anything has shifted or has stretched at all, if you need to ease in some fullness, what I would suggest Find your centers. You already have the center on your outside. Find it on your lining. You can line those up. That's never a bad thing with a big bag. Bag making, you find a lot of centers. Okay, everything lined up really nicely. So there's how it's looking. This is, again, my lining. There is my turning hole. My outside is in there. There's my stitching on my handles. My handles are tucked all the way inside. So now I'm going to stitch this a quarter of an inch all the way around the top. If you're using your domestic machine and you have a free arm, take your table off so that you can stitch like this. So this will be sitting flat on your bed. I do not have that with my machine. So I'm going to stand mine up and kind of stitch from here. So I'll be stitching this way. You can set it flat on your bed and stitch this way. Whatever it takes, it doesn't matter. It's whatever works for you. And because it's such a large bag, it's okay if you don't have a free arm. So I'm gonna stitch a quarter of an inch. I typically only do it once, unless the clips are getting in my way, which sometimes they do, and my seam doesn't really look too straight, then I'll stitch it two times. Two times is never going to hurt anything. It's just making it stronger. But if you are happy with your first time around, that's good. If I am, I'll leave it. And if not, I'll sew it twice. My seam looked pretty good. My clips did not get in my way too much. So I just stitched once around and I am happy with it. So now it's time to turn the bag right side out. So we're gonna go in through that hole in the lining. And here's a little tip for you. I try not to just reach in and pull the bag out. I try to get it started and then just start rolling your lining. You don't want to grab and pull on your bag so hard that you rip anything. That's just not a sound that you want. So especially as your bags get smaller, more purse size, just kind of roll the lining back. I'm just gently rolling it and then just kind of push that. And here is why I leave a gigantic opening because I can put my whole arm in here and I can again poke my corners. I can check everything here, make sure it looks good. My lining looks good. I wanna get in there and poke those corners out. Much easier to do it now than after you've tucked it inside and closed it up. All right, so the last two things left to do, aside from pressing if you need to, you're gonna be closing the lining and top stitching. So what I like to do, what I have found works well, especially when I have all cotton, I kind of stand this up and I haven't closed the lining yet, but that's okay. I'm just gonna start working around this edge and I just kind of like roll it between my fingers, get it all lined up. Cause sometimes it just wants to roll in on itself and I want this super neat and clean across the top. So I'm just kind of rolling the edge, straightening that out, getting rid of some little frays. So like right here, just kind of roll it between my fingers. Get right in there, smooth that out so we don't have any rolling or any puckers. 
And now that I have that done, I won't tuck it all the way in. I will close the lining, tuck that all the way in, and then I'll do my final top stitching. So your final top stitching is gonna go all the way around the top here. You can do, again, an eighth or a quarter. It looks like I did an eighth down here and an eighth up here. So since that's what I did on this bag and I did a quarter down here, I'll probably do a quarter at the top. Either or, or both, it's totally up to you. I'm gonna go back to the machine, close the lining, and I'll show you how I do that, and then I'll do my top stitching. So for the lining, you can hand sew it if you want. I am very much opposed to hand sewing anything. So what I do is I just tuck these edges under like so, and I just stitch an eighth of an inch all the way across. It doesn't matter to me because it's the bottom of the bag. No one's gonna see it, especially once my things are in it. And even if I gave this to someone, it wouldn't bother me. So I'm just tucking those edges under, get it nice and clean like that. And one more. And when I sew, I purposely over sew. So my opening goes from here to here. I will probably sew from here to here. That way I can go all the way across, make sure that I catch everything and I don't have any holes. So I'm gonna stitch this, tuck it in, top stitch, and I'll be back for the final look. She's all done and gorgeous. I am so excited with how this one came out. I haven't used Tula Pink fabric to make a bag in a while and I forgot how much her vibrant colors and her prints just make me so incredibly happy. Um, in case you wanted to know, which you might, this is probably my absolute favorite color of purple. I love a red purple. So this bag is just making me grin. I'm super happy with it. I turned it just like I showed you um, earlier. I closed my lining. And because I finger pressed all the way around here, it was actually really easy once I did my top stitching. My edges turned so nicely. I find that little trick with just kind of finger pressing around the edges works so well to give you a clean straight edge for top stitching. I did a quarter of an inch just like I did on the bottom. You can do a quarter or an eighth or both. It's totally up to you. Bags are just another way that we can express ourselves. And I'm so excited for all of the new bag makers out there. I hope you thoroughly enjoyed this tutorial. I hope it has sparked some of your creativity and you are going to make some more bags. If you're on Facebook, we do have a Facebook group. You can show off all of your So Many Creations makes. You can ask questions. You can get opinions. We all love to have somebody tell us that, yes, those colors look great together. So if you're on Facebook, please join the group. If not, and you want to just show me your bag, you're welcome to send me an email. I love to see happy customers. I love to know that they made their first bag. If you like bags and you're really getting hooked on them, head over to the tutorials playlist on my channel. There's lots of step-by-step -step tutorials for my patterns. So if you want to choose your next one, it's always great that you have the option to kind of have a personal class. Then you can make any bag that you want because I'm there to walk you step-by-step -step through the entire thing. All of my tutorials are filmed the same way. I would say this one in particular probably has a lot of extra information for beginners where the rest of them still have tips and tricks and they walk you through the pattern. They might not have as many beginner little tips for you. If you like tutorials like this and you like these videos, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, click subscribe and hit the notification bell. Thanks for joining me.